Now, the Science Archaeological Project uh, is a slightly strange uh, incarnation of a mixture of archaeology, a bit of history, um, a bit of um, family history, and also, of course, involving, as you see, children, animals, and the National Archive. Now, to give us some idea where we are, we're down in Sussex in the High Weald. If you remember Andy Marvitt's talk from a couple of weeks ago, he describes the, uh, the, the Weald as a separate pay, as he likes to call it, which is a, a geographical and a geological entity. And uh, Newick, which is the village uh, we're going to be talking about, lies literally in the centre of it. Now, when I first went to Newick in 2003, um, I was rather amazed at the fact that, first of all, there was a slightly weird church, which for those of you who know about these things, bizarrely, the middle section has been moved. It's a bit of a weird one, Newick Church, so it makes no sense architecturally. But inside, there is more room. Now, Newick is a tiny, tiny little village. It is literally a tuppenny, halfpenny place you drive through going somewhere else. So I was surprised to find that there were 28 names on the War Memorial in a village that, at the, at, in 1911 census I traced, had 884 souls in the parish. So it's quite a large percentage. It got worse. There is also a monument in the church, which has a number of different names, uh, sorry, in the school, which has a number of different names on. And then through doing a little bit of the research that we did, we found that actually of the 28 names, there were actually 53 men with the connection to Newick who died as a result of service during the Great War or immediately afterwards. And this set me thinking, and I asked a local historian whether anyone had ever done any work on this, and he said no. No one had ever actually traced the lads, looked to them, and done any sort of research on them at all. Because the local historian, Tony, who has helped with the project, uh, he's more in the sort of civil side of things. He doesn't really do the military stuff. And so I thought, no, well, we'll have a look and see what we can do. First thing we discovered was that actually there was a roll of honour kept in the church that the then vicar didn't even know was there. And this roll of honour was kept by the local headmaster, uh, Mr Oldacre, and it's a list of all the lads from his classes that went off and fought. Uh, and a quick uh, bibliography, uh, biography of what they did. And this was brilliant in terms of uh, starting off the research, because of course any research in the First World War is handicapped if you don't know what regiments lads were in, especially as in this case, when they're called Smith. Spencer Smith, the last of four brothers who were actually killed. And, um, but Mr. Oldeck had a strange sort of set of notations. And you can see this one is here. That is uh, the number of brothers people. Mr. Oldacre, of course, also had to record his own son, who died of tuberculosis in 1920, uh, contracted on active service. So this sort of got me thinking as to what I could do with this. So I had a starting point as to I had um, a few names, and, and in the end, 53 names, and then we could look back and see what I could do to trace them. And this really took me out of my comfort zone because it involved um, more documentary sort of text-aided research, which... Um, uh, as anyone in the room will, uh, who knows me will know, um, I'm very much on the dirt side, uh, but suddenly having a, a sort of text-aided uh, project to go on uh, was, uh, was a bit of a challenge. And so this involved uh, several trips to the National Archives in the old days when you had to go there and sit there with a microfiche going round and round and all this sort of stuff. And this is the medal index card of one of the lads, because what we could then find from this, if I knew what regiment he was in, I could then trace his regimental number. From the regimental numbers, you trace a whole lot of things. Bizarrely, tracing the uh, careers of lads who died is considerably easier than tracing careers of lads who survived. I've looked into my own grandfather, and tracing his record is very, very, very difficult. Only 25% of uh, military records survived full stop anyway, because uh, ironically they were destroyed in 1940 when, they were, when they, uh, the area which they were kept was bombed. So you're always um, on the back foot with your search anyway, always. So after a while then, and after various visits, I'd come across the records of a handful of the lads, uh, but knew something about most of them. There are a couple who were, were proved a little bit difficult. One lad with a fantastic name of Ebenezer Burford. Now, I presumed Ebenezer Burford would be very, very easy to trace. There are seven Ebenezer Burfords who were killed in action during the First World War. It couldn't be flippant, but that makes life very, very, very difficult. Anyway, the obvious way around this was an Excel table. Of course it was. Um, so I put this together, which had everything together, all the detail, et cetera, et cetera, which I could add and take away and do a little bit of jiggly pokery and maths. Bizarrely, the average age of death of the New England is, is the mid-20s. Always presume they're going to be young, but actually, in the case of a lot of lads from Newark, this was not the case. So that was the first of all research, and that is actually ongoing. 
because there are weird things that crop up. Sometimes, um, fairly recently, some uh, Red Cross data has come to pass. And also, there are occasionally just little bits of families who will get in touch with me and say, oh, we've got this, and we've got this, and I've seen medals and stuff I didn't even know existed. The other really, really weird part about it was how tiny the gene pool was in 1914 in, in Wilden Village. Literally, every, every one of the 53 men, literally... Certainly, certainly, I know of 40 are related to each other, either by blood or by marriage. The first of all research, as I say, is ongoing. And then was a, 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 what became the Science Archaeology Project came out of this, which is due to this. This is Richard Page. Now, Richard Page, we knew, was, uh, um, had served uh, in the Machine Gun Corps and had been killed in September 1916 because um, Mr. Oldake had recorded that and had kept this picture of him. And we knew he was commemorated here at Tietvel with 72,000 other lads who don't have a known grave in some battle area. So we had the end of the life, but really what I wanted to do, and something which, which I, I, I think is important, is as well as recording the, 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 the circumstances of their, their careers in the army and their deaths, also their lives, because something which certainly, which we'll talk about a bit later possibly, I hated to characterise them by how they died. On the carrot right and by how they lived. Now, Richard, um, slightly peculiar um, history in that um, he was actually of some age when he joined up, just to save your eyes. In a, a cottage called Sciences, this is the 1891 census. He's at school, he's 10 years old, because therefore he was born in 1881. So obviously, by the time he's in the army and he dies in 1916, He's 35 years old. So actually, he is quite aged. Forgive me, but for, for the army, for the army, says he. Um, but his story is even weirder. He wasn't conscripted. He volunteered in 1915. At the time, he was living in Eastbourne, working as a hotel porter, and he had four children. So he wouldn't have been called up anyway. So there is a slightly, there, there is a story here, because his, his record survived on the 25 cents, we've got this, this backstory of what goes on. And there's obviously something that's happened. Obviously something peculiar has gone on. Um, the other thing about him was he, we found there that he, he'd been born in Coney Hall Cottages. And bizarrely, a lot of the local village kids were born in that location. It's not recorded as a hospital. There's no midwife record there in the censuses, but it just seems to be the place that the local kids on the, 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 the agricultural estate are born. Now, for whatever reason, maybe they've got a, a decent water supply, maybe the wise woman lives there. there there's got to be a, a reason, but we haven't actually been able to trace that too. And funnily enough, the being born at Coney Hall Cottages carries on right into the 20th century. Babies are born there in the 1950s, despite the fact that isn't, there is a cottage hospital there. There is this strange link. Now, having been born there, um, and having been living in Sciences when he's a child, he moves away quite quickly. And as I say, he's a hotel porter by, by 1915 when he joins up working in Eastbourne. But there is definitely, definitely a story as to what goes on. Now, having discussed this place called Sciences, I spoke to the historian Tony again as to exactly what was going on, because I couldn't find the place on the map in the village. There were no cottages called that. I mean, as you can imagine, there's lots of cottages called Old Thatched Cottage and various bits and pieces. And he said, well, I've never heard of it either. So we basically um, put our eyes together and went to talk to the local landowner, Mr Slater. Mr Slater is, 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 is proper gentry. Um, basically, this map, he owns pretty much everything you can see. Uh, the village of Newick up in the, uh, the top uh, left-hand corner, they'd have to move to work out which way is left and right there. Um, and then a very, very rural landscape around uh, with superb, um, fantastic names like um, Bunce's Pit, Bunce's Farm, Vroom Lie, and my personal favorite, Vuggles Farm. And they're all medieval farms. So basically you've got a, a landscape that's very, very unchanged. So I went to see Mr Slater after arranging to meet him on, on a Sunday afternoon to have a two, so he, he would have to wander around to see if he knew or any ideas he had. So I turned up at his house on Sunday afternoon um, and he's having his Sunday lunch. He said, I'm terribly sorry, I've forgotten that, that you were coming. He said, that's not a problem, I'm coming on time. Because he wouldn't hear of this. And he said, have you eaten? A marvellous phrase. <laughs> so after what I described as a gargantuan Sunday lunch, he and I then waddled out to a field, which he said, well, historically, this field is called sciences. 
was an A. Well, I said, well, OK, well, that's fine then. So we wandered up there in his Land Rover, obviously. And as, as you can imagine, a, a man of his standing, it's a, it's a very old beaten up man. So we went to this field and had a look. Yeah, there, well, there was a chap here a couple of years ago who looked at this, 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 and said there was, it was probably some, some archaeological stuff going on. So I looked up a couple of years ago and discovered that actually this couple of years ago was the mid 1970s. Um, and when we walked into the field, um, it became obvious that there was something serious going on, which is in one corner, there is this massive, let's call it a bump, which the field boundary, as you can see, carefully respects. So he then said to me, well, we, we, we think the cottage may have been up there because there was a well up there as well within living memory. I was like, OK, fair enough, so there we go, that's fantastic. So we're standing up there in amongst the cows looking around this. And he said, you're an archaeologist, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, well, why don't you come and dig it up? So when I picked myself off the floor, having been offered a chance to dig up something by, by a landowner, um, I thought, well, actually, we can probably do something with this. I, I'd envisaged a couple of test pits at the weekend or whatever, just, just trying to get, trying to get your handle on this. Because from the rest of the earthworks in the field, as we'll see, the bump is just the highlight of the field. This field for a field in, in Weald is remarkably uh, bumpy. So then this sort of, sort of a plan began to slowly form. I suppose to answer this project um, came into being. Um, and then I went to the school because Mrs Slater, Catherine, uh, was at that time a governor. So she said, well, why don't you get the kids involved? And I thought, well, couldn't hurt. So I thought we'd, we'd go there and just walk about it. Anyway, I went to see the head, the head at the time, Mrs Thomas, and uh, I sat down for a meeting with her. And before I really knew what I was doing, I'd agreed to take 230 children, aged between the ages of 4 and 11, <laughs> and put them in a field in the middle of nowhere and give them sharp things to play with. Um, not long before the project was due to start, when well, this was back in June 2010, I had what I suppose you could describe as a bit of a funny turn on site and was taken to hospital and stuff. Um, and the doctor said, well, that's quite simple. All you need to do is avoid stress. I then told him that in three weeks' time, what we were doing with children, 30 children in the field, and he said, OK, then, I'll see you in three weeks' time. Um, luckily not. Touch wood quickly. Now... This is the first recce we did to the field. Uh, this is uh, myself and Mandy, who was watching on, on, on Teams. Um, and we were basically chased out of this field by the cows. Now, my recollection is that Mandy actually vaulted this barbed wire fence to get out, whilst being chased by the ringleader here, you can clearly see. Um, and obviously, there was going to be a problem with this, because it's a cow field. But luckily, uh, the landowner, Mr. Slater, and the tenant farmer, were very, very understanding and agreed that obviously we would keep everything separate and the cows would be taken out so we could then get on. So June 2010 comes around. First thing we do is a bit geophysics. Now, it becomes fairly obvious, almost straight away from the geophysics, that actually the site of the cottage is pretty much still there. That's for the bump. And as you can see, the, the field boundary respecting it. Geophysics shows the garden still there with the garden walls, shows this track still going down. And then we had a bit of LIDAR. And as you can see, there's still it's still very much there fossilised in the landscape. I spoke to uh, Paddy, who was uh, uh, for a number of years uh, the, uh, the head honcho on the estate in terms of the management of it. And he said, well, there's certain places you don't want to dig. I said, OK. So we agreed those. Uh, and then we agreed places that he thought would be safe and fine to dig, nothing nasty, nothing unexpected, the cottage area itself and the garden and certain other parts of the field. So that gave us targets. Now, we then, of course, moved on to site. Now, at first, our resources were limited, although uh, currently the LASC management did provide us with, uh, with uh, some funding. And um, we then, uh, by beg, stealing and borrowing various stuff, got the project off the ground. Uh, and in the summer of 2010, uh, we actually put our first boots on the ground uh, in terms of kids. Now, over the years, um, it's now run for five separate seasons. Uh, we've ended up by basically building a shanty town uh, on, on the field uh, every every summer. Uh, and actually, while I think of it in the background, that is County Hall Cottages, uh, which is the, the, the local, if you like, um, birthing house described locally in Clotherwood Fabulous. 
over the years then, you can actually tell vaguely what year it is by what cabin we've got, what bit of tent we've stolen. In this case, that's the little one is from the Scouts. Um, and we've had massive uh, sport locally. Um, to be fair, Newick is, a, is, a, is a, an affluent area, but that doesn't mean people are, are duty bound to support it. And they have been. And we've had immensely generous uh, offers of help from various, various people, both financial and, and boots on the ground. But there is a slight problem with it being in the middle of nowhere, and that it's very, very windy. And I regularly turn up to find that that, which really should be there, is now laying on its back in the next field. Although my personal favourite is still this one. Because I swear the kids didn't realise it should have sides on it. <laughs> so as I said, we've uh, you know, every every year we do it, say five seasons now, about 230. So we had 240 kids this year because we had some we had uh, Ukrainian kids this year as well. Um, we divide them up into two into, into, into sets to go on site. The school has a wonderful system whereby they have a buddy, whereby a younger child has an older kid to look after them, show them ropes, et cetera, et cetera, at school, reading, et cetera. And that then comes out of the field. And the younger ones love this because they just spend time with their buddy out in the open, not in the school. The most exciting thing for them is this. Uh, for the rest of us, a mundane item. But when you are four, a, a chemical toilet is fantastic. Especially when your buddy shows you that you can rock it a little bit and you can rock the whole line of them. One year we had a thunderstorm. We're holding down the corners of those tents that were lent to us. Uh, one of the TAs, bless her, was in tears. The kids thought this was the best thing ever. And actually that we'd somehow arranged it, that the thunderstorm would come to the site. So without further ado, that's actually what we do on site. Now, the first year, I'm going to confess and hold my hands up completely, we rather winged everything. Because what we needed to do, first of all, was something that Leslie, our surveyor, was uh, very keen to do, was get a nice, decent 3D survey of the entire field. So this would give us uh, lots of targets to aim at. So we quickly got on with this the first year, but also while teaching the kids various survey methods. So good old fashioned stuff, measuring right angles, that sort of thing. Which they were the, again, bizarrely, the things that I remember at school as being really boring. If you do them in the field and you're actually showing them the three, four, five triangles and stuff, they get this, then they do this. The older ones showed their buddies, et cetera, et cetera, and it, it worked really, really well. What, of course, gives also like was a bit of tech. So Leslie here is showing them uh, the ropes on various bits and base bits of survey kit. The thing I take from this is wonderful setting up of a field like that low, which is brilliant. Um, so practical problems, things that I didn't think of. Luckily, Leslie, she worked for you, worked for you. not the tallest person ever. So I actually worked perfectly. Me, probably wouldn't have worked, let's be completely honest. So we were able to show the kids a whole range of different stuff um, in terms of survey. Because of course, the problem with archaeology, of course, is, is that very term itself. Are we just going to be digging holes? No, we're going to show you how to do this. We're going to show you how to do this. And look at this and this. And of course, then uh, we're able to use the, our very posh GPS kit. He's now taller than me, I to add. So, what did we come up with then? Well, this is the answer. This beautiful 3D survey, a slight exaggeration on the vertical scale, which shows a field that just doesn't have a bump in one corner, but has a very complex set of earthworks in it. Very complex indeed. Um, and then if we overlay this or put it next to a nice historical map, fossilised in the landscape is a beautiful, beautiful. And bizarrely, this is still the parish boundary between Newick and Barkham, which runs right across the middle of the field. Lovely little thing in the corner there, there's this nice little cottage drawn in with a nice little tile roof and a chimney, a barn next to it, weirdly shown in three dimensions, running off in the end. That's actually the next field, which is strangely called Barn Field. How do they do it? Um, so fossilised beautifully, and I think you're looking at basically the medieval pattern too, because what is, I think, well, we have no evidence of, is actually what seems to be a medieval routeway with house platforms down one side of it, with a pond next to it, and then maybe a posher house at the top, which, which, which has a lovely view and is also drier, 
because this gets very, very wet indeed. It still does now. In fact, it's flooded at the moment, the modern road. So, as we shall see then, actually, my idea that we take, or Mrs. Thomas's idea, that we take 230 kids who are in the middle of nowhere and dig up willow pattern, suddenly became a slightly more complicated uh, process as soon as we put a spade in the ground. Now, what we planned to do right from the beginning was to give the kids an education in uh, fines uh, recognition, all sorts of stuff. But obviously, ASE has got a nice set of kits that we can then show them bits and pieces, the outreach kits. So we did this. We added a few bits and pieces from here and a few local sort of bits. This is something we carried on and slightly tweaked over the years. Because what we now do, actually do a more hands-on, um, basically, um, distributing stuff, recognising what it is, and then a sort of a little, a little uh, an un unofficial, not serious test as to how it all works. And surprisingly, they're normally very, 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 very good indeed. To be fair, uh, having been doing archaeology for 30 years, I sometimes have struggled between some of the course of medieval stuff and some of the Roman stuff. So I'm not going to criticise them for not being able to do it straight away. They always get the bones, which is an interesting thing for kids, because um, the only bones they ever see are from KFC, they would claim. So the idea that bigger animals have bigger bones is a slightly weird concept to them sometimes, but one we certainly get across. Clay pipes they love. Although trying to explain to kids about smoking is, is increasingly difficult. <laughs> That'd be vaping now, obviously. I mean, I'm sure when I was a kid, this wasn't an issue. And it's, that's another weird thing. There are so many sort of odd things that when I'm trying to explain something, I think to myself, well, hang on, I mean, I'm not that old, but uh, okay, I am that old. Um, but then there would have been things that would have been easier to explain you know, 20, 30 years ago. So then, so that's, that's their kind of introduction then to, to stuff. We get them to do a, a nice sort of bit of reconnaissance. Or if you like, almost a desk space assessment. We have actually got a proper desk space assessment. But here, and this shows beautifully, that big bump in the background is the parish boundary. There's this massive, odd bank that runs right across the field. So we get them to wander around. We get them to uh, draw what they've seen and try and get some sort of idea. Of course, it does regularly involve alien landing grounds, obviously, but mostly drawn by the parents, to be fair. Um, but also the fact that we've now got on the team uh, the local reverend, uh, Reverend Paul Monday, who is absolutely fantastic with the kids. I love him. Um, he's not a, not what you call a usual vicar in that he used to be a publican. And he is an amazing fellow, actually. His connection with the kids and with people in the parish is, 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 is amazing. Uh, he's not the one who didn't know anything was in the church. He's, he's, he's a placement. So the kids have a good look around. They get a feel for the landscape as well, because obviously we are literally, as you saw from the map, in the middle of nowhere here. You, know, you can see three houses from this side. Got beautiful views across the valley, beautiful views into woodland at the back. You've got, the, it, it's just for a wander around, there's butterflies, you, you name it, running around. So we occasionally get deer, just bound in, then bound out again. So it gives, it gives a nice sort of a feet on the ground experience. Master, of course, what they want to do is the digging. And we are, we are digging heavy. They spend most of their time digging. Uh, in the mornings, we've got, hey, here you can see tiddlies and big ones. Tiddlies go home at lunchtime normally, and then the bigger ones get the afternoon to do some heavy labouring for me. Um, and what we've done is uh, uh, basically uh, test bits, meter-meter test bits, which we spread right across the landscape. You can see beautifully this image, actually, how the cottage sits. They're about to start climbing up onto this mound where the cottage was. We know from... Um, Map progression, so the cottage is certainly there in the, the, the 1730s. Um, it's obviously there before, and we have found, as we've excavated right the way through, we now have a good scatter of medieval pottery up there too. So I am not unreasonably presuming that we also have a medieval building there too, as we said, at this pin that you can see. What a beautiful place to have a building. It's definitely what best one. But certainly the kids, I would say the vast, vast majority can get it and they love it. Especially the buddy thing. I have again, I haven't appreciated, although my kids were there and my kids went through the system, uh, how much that means to the kids. Being out and about with their buddies, they could show their buddy what they found, or their mates, also was the other thing. And here, a discourse on method. Um, we are done we, we haven't done any great um, spatial analysis on the site for the very good reason that the kids are inclined to go and show their friends what they found. And then Either through malice, which we get with some of the older ones, they would deliberately put stuff in the wrong place, or the tiddly ones who can't remember where they were digging, 
we sometimes get the fact that you've got no particular spatial spatial houses in it. And that, that, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think, given that it's all top soil finds anyway, we've also had our stuff taken from the site as well, which is the, the weirdest thing. A couple of kids thought they'd take stuff as souvenirs and show their, show their friends at school. That got uh, knocked on the head very, very quickly. So digging on the summit and also digging down that lane that we talked about, you know, the route way, these are uh, excavations on those house platforms, which have produced uh, a medieval pot, a meager amount of medieval pottery, but not medieval, medieval pottery to say uh, that I think we have a row of medieval structures on that, on that, in, in those house platforms. Uh, we're going to do more work here in the future, um, because at the moment, uh, as you can see, these, these aren't well dug. Um, the platforms in the foreground are still sitting there waiting to be, uh, waiting to be explored, um, and we will certainly be doing that in future years. Now, in terms of the method that we spoke about, um, everything on site is sieved. So the kids dig a metre by metre test fit. Basically, I, I loosen the top off, take the turf off, and then the kids go in, uh, get digging, sieve everything. Because, of course, you can't expect them to recognise the difference between a, a struck flint and, and a... We, we, we talk about these things, obviously, but I wouldn't expect that level of expertise in a four- or five-year-old. I don't think that's reasonable. So everything's sieved, and everything that isn't soil, we keep. Then one of the archaeologists on site then looks at it, and then from that, we get a nice assembly of stuff. And I hadn't realised how important the sitting would be. I thought the sitting was in, in some ways just something I wanted to do just to check we weren't missing the sort of stuff. But actually, as I've said, it's actually become vital in terms of uh, the research aims. And this is a typical assembly from one of the pits up on the top near the, near the, uh, near the cottage. Clearly, lots of uh, building material, CBM, lots of bent nails, lots of bits of clay pipe, lots of bits of post medieval pottery, lots of willow pattern. The kids do a project on Willow Pattern on how, what the pattern means. So one year they were explaining to me what the pattern means because I didn't know. Um, glass and hiding in amongst the stuff from time to time, little bits of medieval pottery and also woodwork. We really, really weren't expecting that at all. So a really nice post medieval assemblage. And in terms of research, I suppose, um, Sciences does uh, fill a gap that there is, certainly in, in Sussex, with rural assemblages. Uh, Luke Barber, who's been, who was at the Archive of Southie for a number of years, uh, has highlighted in research agencies, but out that one area that is massively missing are these nice rural assemblages from cottages like Sciences to see what rural existence was like in this case with pottery 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Metalwork too survives very well in the soil there. So buttons, coins, we've had uh, six or seven coins now, um, little bits of jewellery, all sorts of stuff. Knives, forks, spoons, uh, latches and doors, uh, very good metalwork assemblages. Um, lots of, um, again, talking about the way things changes, what I call blakies, the things that go on your heel. Kids have no idea what blakies work. Of course, when they're usually work, they're thrown away. Um, so talking about those different sort of things that we're not. A good metal assembly for And again, as, as Luke has pointed out, the problem we have is you know, we have metal detecting assemblages from, from sites, but quite often metal detectors aren't really that keen on the later stuff, so maybe they're slipping through the net. But here at Sciences, because we keep everything because we sieve, we're getting the metal work to go and everything as well. And then there's a lot of surprise, which is flint work, quite a lot of flint work. Um, because uh, we've been sieving, of course, everything is, uh, is um, very much uh, retrieved, and we have got a, a small, but I think still significant, assemblage of metallic material from the site. And given that, that the Wilder of Sussex has sort of traditionally um, been underrepresented in terms of prehistoric stuff, this actually is, is important and an interesting, again, research sideline that I haven't thought about, but have now looked at in terms of there's material from Muckfield, not a million miles away, six or seven miles away, where there are actually rock shelters. So maybe you've got a, a network of rock shelters uh, and then you've got seasonal camps and Stances fits perfectly, as you saw from the picture when I'm walking up the hill. It sits over what must have been a stream valley. So it's in the perfect spot that we know from other wilderness sites for a temporary hunting camp to exploit the resources going on. And the kids love this. Absolutely love this. And we're saying, oh, yeah, well, that's, um, well, yeah, that's probably, that's, you know, we look at that, we're 10,000 years old. This sort of blows their mind. And this is a problem we've got as well, of a timeline. When you're four or five, a timeline is quite a difficult thing. That's something again we've tried to do there by sort of elongating things out by saying, well, if, if this is this is this, then that's going to be there, you're there, and this sort of thing. And we think it works. 
The project then has, I think, highlighted what can be done. Um, Mrs. Thomas, who was the head, um, very enlightened. The school at Newick is, is a, an outstanding school. In fact, it, it's, a, it's an outstanding plus in that they actually use it as a, a place to teach teachers. It's really the creme de la creme sort of school. Um, and what surprised me was in later years when everything got set up and, and I, I was more confident we were doing it right, we offered it to other schools in the area. And they all said, no, not a single one of the other primary schools wanted to do it. And that really surprised me. Um, because, I mean, it is a, a unique opportunity. There's, there's, there's no, no way around it. Uh, and we, we spoke to a couple of the heads about the fact that if this was being done by, say, someone like Dig Ventures, you know, this would be a lot of money. Whereas uh, we, the kids come free. We, we thought a couple of years ago, we were short on funding about charging, but actually, um, touch wood again this year, we haven't struggled um, money-wise. Certainly what I'd like to pay tribute to is the team. Um, over the years, a, a, a varied team of people have been on site, um, some of whom left somewhat shell-shocked, some of whom left desperate to have children, well, that inexplicable to me. Um, also, in terms of, of um, the well-being of the team, it is something really quite different. Um, the kids can be quite difficult. The parents can be extremely difficult. My personal favourite is still the uh, someone who turned up one day and asked if we could move the site near the school because it'd be easy to pick up. But the bottom line is that in terms of ASE staff, it's a bit of a breath of fresh air. Obviously, we're caught off on sites, uh, rescue sites where we are under pressure. Um, you know, we've got time boundaries. There can sometimes be a bad atmosphere on site occasionally. But as scientists, it really is a breath of fresh air. And it's nice to literally be out in the middle of nowhere. Um, kids, no pressures to get things done in time. It also involves people who've left ASE who've kindly come back, like Gemma. But I can tell which gear it is, normally from the colour of Gemma's hair. This group, actually, I had, this is one of the pits down in the medieval area. Because obviously, it's straight digging up on the top, you find lots of stuff, lots of willow pattern, lots of stuff. But of course, in terms of research, sometimes, you know, to a 10 year old, it's actually in the boring trench, which is what this one was. Bless this lot, they got on with it, came up with the medieval pottery, jobs are good. Now, certainly in terms of um, how the project went on, certainly from the first year, I say five years now, we, we've changed a few things that we've done. But what, of course, is, is, is the constant, is, is the flow of kids. And um, as um, we've touched upon, some of the kids are great, some of the kids are less great. Um, we've, had a bit, we've had a little bit of trouble, but the, the vast majority are fantastic. Parents have been fantastic, we have lots of parent volunteers. Uh, all the TAs come in, all the teachers, although some of them quite obviously don't want to be there, which I've, I'm amazed by, but that, that's up to them. Um, and certainly without the, the obviously the teachers um, uh, say wherewithal, we wouldn't be able to get on with this. TAs as well. TAs do a huge amount. Um, obviously, having I mean, this number of kids in the middle of a field does have a certain level of uh, health and safety and risk assessments. Luckily, the risk assessments for it are all done uh, for the kids by the school. Obviously, ASC have got our own risk assessments. Uh, for, for our staff, but the kids <laughs> are very, very separate. They've got their own first aid, et cetera, et cetera. But it's something that focused my mind looking at community stuff. So I'm looking to try and do a lot more community stuff with ASC in the future. And it's little things like that that I've got to focus my mind on and get my head around. Because obviously it's massively important. We decided the first year we'd have an open day on the Saturday. We thought the parents can come along, have a look, see what's going on, hope they notice it. And we thought, well, a few people will turn up. Um, I did the usual joke that I've always done on Facebook, that there'll be a massive traffic jam and the police helicopter will have to come up and all this sort of stuff. We had 200 people turn up. There was a massive traffic jam down the lane. No police helicopter, disappointed me. Um, but we actually did cause an actual traffic issue. And this is ridiculous. But the first year, we um, put out lots of fines show people what their tours of the site, all this sort of stuff. And it worked really, really well. So the 200 people turning up was a bit of a surprise, I would, I would be completely honest. Um, and in subsequent years, numbers have been considerably less, I, I, I hasten to add. Um, but it was nice to have an open day for the parents to come, the parents who couldn't make it during the week to help them to come and look, grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, people just, just come and have, have a bit of a newsy. 
And that was very, very nice. And people came from, from, from far and wide, because I mean, the Sussex Archaeological Community, especially the, the unpaid community, um, very close, and um, lots of interaction between them. And so a lot of people from, from far and wide came, and that was really, really nice. And it's continued. So the first year, we thought we'll, we'll do sandboxes, just do sandboxes. Few, few little bits of artifacts in. I love, love this picture. Um, and then the following years, I thought, why are we going to all the effort of putting out sandboxes when we can just get people to dig on the site? So with disclaimers, the, the, the people then came on site, and this is actually from this one last year now, of course. This is people at, at the, uh, on the open on the Saturday, which is basically the school kids coming, dragging their mums and dads in, and they happily spend the whole day. Certainly, the fact that we now have this idea that the open day as well as you know, this have a go whole thing is great. And I must actually point out that one of our managers at ASE, Ron, had to be physically dragged out of the have a go hole when he came to it because he loved it. So, certainly, that is an extra dimension. The open day, I think, is hugely important. We do lots of social media, obviously, people who can't get to the site. The access here, is, 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 disabled access, is, is impossible. We have, we have actually tried. Um, so there are lots of things we can and can't do in terms of access for people. But certainly the Saturday, I think, is, is a vital thing for, the, for the, if like, the community. And again, this year, we had about 50 or 60 people turn up. But of course, all things come to an end. And at the end of each season, we normally do a week, we have to fill everything back in again. Of course, it's a cow for now, of course, this does leave us um, in between years. We do it every three years. The kids get all the, all the fines go back to the school. It was a great right from the beginning with the county, et cetera, et cetera, that everything from the, 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 um, the, the field either stays in the field, i.e. all of the CBM, which once it's studied, normally goes back there. And all the other fines, including all the coins, and matter, all go to the school for them to teach. So they do uh, Victorians. They do uh, Stone Age. They do a whole range of stuff. They can then use this sort of hands-on stuff that the kids can then dig up. And I go and do sessions with them at school. And they say, oh, I don't doubt that. Oh, I don't doubt that. It amazes how many kids have dug up the same thing. My favourite was a, a Victorian ink pot that I actually found when we were opening up the site uh, a couple of years ago. By the time it was recorded, that ink pot had been found by about 10 different kids in six or seven different holes. So this again is that problem of the distribution and then the spatial thing. What can we say then? I think from the topographic survey, from the excavation, from the results of the excavation, we can say we've got a medieval site here, which interestingly was exactly what Fred Tebbett said in the 1970s without doing it. He thought it was a moated site, and I can see why he said that, but I think with a more um, nuanced <laughs> survey, we now know it's not a moated site. I think it is a lane, with house platforms down one side. The really interesting thing, actually, which shows up quite interestingly on here, is the fact that we've got little breaks in it and possibly a building hiding in there. We haven't played with that yet. That's something that we are, we are going to look at in time. So, Lane, as we saw um, in the 1744 map, all still there. Then, by 1744, the house platforms have gone out of use. Uh, but the cottage at the top is still in use, uh, very much so, uh, from the material culture, it goes right through. We know it's in the 1901 census, but it then disappears. So we think, and certainly by, um, I think it's 1903, it's listed as derelict. So we've got a very tight time, we've got a nice finishing one. The, the opening of, of what goes on, we're pushing back. This year, we've got what looks like Saxo Norman pottery too on the, on the summit. So we might have a, a, a building going right back, which has then altered this landscape with this nice, I mean, let's not go raving bad, but a beautiful, nice, almost ceremonial way in the up to it. That's a terrible term, I'll take it back. Um, but, you know, nice, again, nice sight lines, that sort of thing, really, really beautiful. So clearly a building of some status originally, which then goes through, turns into Stance's farm, uh, then becomes Stance's cottage, and then falls out of use, and now the only visible thing there is actually is, is the remains of the well, which, as you can imagine, we very quickly fence off without the kids anywhere near. And so the field then slumbers for three years. You can see again here very clearly uh, topographically. Originally, the site um, was approached down the what do you get the screen? That's useful, isn't it? Um, down the lane that comes through here, that's the sunken lane. At some point in the Victorian era too, it changes, it comes up down this fence line. 
but always, always really isolated in the middle of this field you saw for the map. It really is for Sussex, literally in the middle of no place. It really is. Um, we were very, very lucky uh, last year to win an award, um, which was this Marsh Award for uh, engagement uh, with, with youth. Fabulous. Went up to a, a partner and I went up to, to Newcastle to this, this event. So that was nice. And that, and that was a that was a recognition, I suppose, of, of what we've tried to do. Um, and it's always nice to recognise what we've done. Um, but certainly uh, as a springboard, I hope to certainly doing it again and certainly to try and involve other schools. I'm, I'm still it still grates with me, I'll be honest, that the other schools in the area didn't wish to be involved. Because I'm thinking, well, what's wrong with the project then? You don't want to do this. Is it, is, are, you, are you frightened of the risk assessments or all this sort of stuff? And I think that's what it comes down to. And hopefully we now have some sort of bona fide thing to say, look, we do actually know what we're doing. You know? we, 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 you know, we're not, we're not going to hurt them deliberately. We have to come back to Richard, Richard Page. Now, it's because of him that we're digging into who we took. Um, his story is, is, like a lot of the new lads, a fairly tragic one. And as I say, that there is something, again, at the back of my mind, that there must be more we can learn about him. Because there's even better part to, to his story. Um, when he's training um, on the South Downs in 1915, after he joins up, he goes AWOL. He goes absent without leave for, for over a weekend. And I think, from the position we can at Summers Hill, he goes to see his family. So maybe whatever had gone on and caused him to join up, he tries to make better before he goes overseas. And I, and I hope he did. He's killed in September 1916, uh, and we don't think he got a chance to come back after he was uh, mobilised. What I want to do is put some sort of memorial up there, um, both to the site with some information boards, perhaps, and also a memorial to him. There is a village um, uh, war memorial now, a very new one, which was unveiled a few years ago, on the back of some of this research. But I also want him to be commemorated here, uh, where he was a child. Because as I say, I don't want to characterise him or the other New York lads by, by the nature of their deaths. I want them to be celebrated for the nature of their lives. So I want the idea of something here, uh, of, of him you know, as a 10-year-old child, he lived here and played this. Because again, the kids love the idea that we occasionally find things like marbles. So is it they're actually finding his toys, which would, which would, would be amazing, a bit difficult to prove would be amazing. So if you think something like this, um, this, this viewpoint being perfectly on the valley, something on the, on the summit. So that, that's, if you like, a bit of a legacy that we're going to leave it when we finally finish. But, um, but as I say, I've already promised the, the current head that we will do it again. So we will, do it. we will be doing it again, whether I'll be to or not. Now, Certainly, um, a project like Sciences would not be possible without a huge amount of help from various and incredibly varied uh, backgrounds and places and people and, uh, and organisations. My favourites on here being, um, as you can see, a, a very random uh, selection of people have offered stuff. My favourite is the Lady Vernon Newark Educational Trust. Lady Vernon uh, lived, in the seventh, uh, lived in the 18th century. Uh, she, was a, uh, she owned the estate, she asked when owned the estate. Um, little bit problematic at the moment because they earn their money from sugar uh, and they had plantations in the West Indies. And the trust she set up, the education trust, was for the education of the village girls. This, of course, fell for the Charities Commission. It's now for the education of, uh, of both boys and girls. And every year they give us lots of money. And so I have this great this image of Lady Vernon um, being amazed about what her money was used for. Um, and uh, if you want some really weird ones, Uphill Freemasons, who often very kindly offer me some money. Um, uh, and the, um, lots of different odd sort of things that were that basically, that, um, I don't want to use the phrase um, brown envelopes, but literally. Um, and the fact that we had a the school uh, set up a fund whereby we could, um, lots of money was given to us for fund. Um, which was great through the sort of PayPal thing, all that sort of, sort of stuff that they've done. Um, certainly the management at Arco South East has been great, uh, allowing me time to do stuff and um, doing the, uh, the various invoicing and stuff. Um, and I suppose the most, however, uh, relevant would be um, the Uckfield Chiropractic Clinic. 
which is certainly the most appropriate archaeological response to ever. Because, of course, as you've seen, when the kids are finished with their digging, we have to put it back in again. Now, as we said, Stance is, is a great um, project, not only hopefully for the kids, but also, I would argue, for the people from Archaeology South East. Um, it's very, very different to what we do, this sort of thing on a daily basis. It's, it's, if archaeology can be relaxing, it's relaxing. Um, it's something very, very different. Because um, I'm not going to pretend about this. A lot of archaeologists, and I'm one of them, get onto a treadmill. And there are times when you just look back and you think, what am I doing this for? Um, and things like science is hopefully, or to me, I, I, I'll be honest about this, uh, sort of a recharge my batteries. I'm not pretending it doesn't because it does. Um, and that is, I think, a hugely important part of it um, in that it doesn't only offer stuff to the kids, but it actually offers stuff to the staff as well. To round off then, I suppose, um, what science is, has done is it's shown that community archaeology can work. It's difficult. Community archaeology and rescue archaeology are not easy bedfellows because of various issues, uh, both on site, safety wise, um, and a whole range of other issues, which we certainly haven't got time to go into. Um, also, uh, post medieval archaeology, of course, which the majority of material from sciences is. Um, I would say that post medieval archaeology has been, for the sort of 30 years I've been doing archaeology, a bit of a poor relation. Um, certainly there are those, and um, for a while, even Kent County Council, who didn't believe that anything post-1700 was worth recording. Um, and that's now changed, I hasten to add, um, and also changed at, at all the organisations I know of, um, because it's been, it's been recognised, and again, bringing in with the, the sort of research side that Luke Barber's talked about in Sussex, that actually it's got something to offer. Certainly in terms of rural settlements, we know very little about material culture and rural settlement. This is a more urban environment down in Shoreham. It has something to offer. And I think the mixture, um, certainly at Stimes, of um, community archaeology, introducing kids, enthusing both kids and adults with, with both the digging and the open day, and also showing that post-medieval archaeology can really give us some answers to questions is hugely, hugely important. But of course, there are still lots and lots of problems, lots and lots of issues. This picture was taken 20 years ago. Um, and despite, as I've said, the fact I think we, we are getting better, I think things are improving. As you can see, we are we're still looking into it. Thank you. <laughs>